Let's pray. Father God, you are the great I am. There's none beside you. No one worthy but you. Thank you that as we come together and lift our voices, your spirit reminds us of who you are. Because if we're honest, we forget. And we need to be reminded that you alone are worth our worship and praise in our whole lives. So speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Just to make you aware of a couple of things before we jump into our series, Pathway to Purpose. You've probably seen these cards in the lobby. You've seen perhaps the posts on social media, uh, The Doubter's Guide to Jesus. Um, John Dixon is going to be, in just two Saturdays from now, uh, starting a four-week Saturday evening series right here in this room uh, from 6.30 to 8. It's not a church service. It's designed to reach out to people who have questions. Perhaps that's you. Maybe you have your own questions about Jesus, how you can know him and trust him, or you certainly know people who do. If you've wondered about how could I share the good news of Jesus with somebody? You struggle with the, with the words or you don't know how to answer questions. This is perfect for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your family members, those you work with, those that live nearby. We want to fill this room with people to discover how amazing Jesus is. And there's honestly nobody I know probably on the planet better than John Dixon to do this. We're really fortunate to have him. He's going to be doing an outstanding job. And so four weeks, by the way, these are not, you can come to, we hope you come to all of them. But if you happen to be gone and miss one, you can still come to them. They're, they're a series, but they're also standalone messages talking about uh, who Jesus is and how you can know him and trust him. So again, make plans to attend. Pick one of these up or 10 of these up or 50 of these up and hand them out this week. Hopefully we'll see you in just a couple Saturdays for that event. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is our annual meeting. Today, at our South Street campus, who doesn't love a great church meeting? It's one of the best things ever. And so we're going to be at our, uh, our South Street campus following the second service for our annual meeting. And of course, if you're a member here, uh, voting on the budget and the board members is part of your responsibility, part of what we do. But even if you're not, we, what we do at our meeting is we look back in gratitude for all that God has done. We celebrate together the year. And we look forward in the faith to what he will do in the future. So even if you're new and you want to find out more about who we are, this is a great chance for you. All are welcome to attend. Uh, again, following our second service at our South Street campus. And the last thing I want to talk to you about uh, is uh, our, our plans here at Kesslinger campus to add a third service. I've already seen it happening this morning. People trying to find seats. It's difficult. Uh, once, the, once we're getting close to capacity at our services, we need to make room for our guests. You probably felt that experience as you come in. If you come in a little bit late, I see people saving seats on the aisle. I know how that works. Uh, but we need to make room for our guests because we're growing. This is a good problem to have. But it is a challenge we have to solve together. So if you consider this your home and you're a core member here, a regular attender, I want to encourage you uh, to find to choose to attend the early or the late hour and consider how you might serve, even monthly, in our kids' ministries at the middle hour because we need your help to make this work. It isn't magic. We are the church. We have to do it together. And so if you could scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you, and uh, there's a little survey. Uh, we really need your input on this. There's seven questions. They're, they're, just, they're just multiple choice. Click the button. You can do that now or when you get home. But scan to get the, uh, the, the survey up. Let us know your feedback as we prepare uh, to mid-October to launch a third service here. Which is, quite frankly, it's a good thing that people are coming to hear about the good news of Jesus here. But we have to make room for them. All right? Let's open God's Word together now as we jump into our series uh, called Pathway to Purpose. Last week we started this series, Pathway to Purpose. We look at the, the church uh, as a whole. What is God's purpose for his people on the planet? The church wherever you find it. And then this, next, this week and the next two, we're going to look at your part in that, your purpose as part of the church. You're going to see this diagram and see these six G's up here, uh, not just in this series, but throughout this year. We think these, this, these six G's represent what God wants for us, not just from us, but more things to do, but for us as his followers, as part of the church. You'll see them up there on the screen. We gather for worship. We connect in groups. We grow spiritually, give generously, go and serve, and share the gospel. We'll be talking about two of those each of the next couple of weeks. Uh, just yesterday morning, I was over at our North Aurora campus for a men's ministry event, speaking to a men there gathering. Uh, There's over 30 guys there. I met a guy who's a brand new believer in Christ. And he was asking the question. He's excited about his faith. He's, he's thrilled and to discover there's a God who knows him and made him in his image and loves him and died for him and forgives him and wants a relationship with him. Blown away by this. And he's literally asking the question, what do I do? What should I do? I'm in, I'm in, I wanna do, I wanna do the thing, what do I do? Well, quite frankly, that's the question we should all be asking. What should we be doing, Lord? And we think this represents the answer. Living a 6G life, 
We're going to talk about what this means as we go. We think through each of these, that we didn't invent these. Other churches have similar things. They're deeply biblical, and we want to be really practical in this series for what it is we should be doing specifically. Last week, we looked at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Just by way of review, let me just read through this again and see if you can pick out some of those G's in this passage that the first Christians were doing. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. When I read that, I get excited because God does the work. When his people come together and not perfectly, but faithfully try to live out their faith, God does miraculous things like bringing people into his family, like the man I met yesterday, like many of you. The Lord does that when we're faithful to live the way he's called us to live and to do what he's called us to do. This week, we're going to focus on two G's that fit under the phrase experience grace. Don't be misled. Experience grace does not mean have an emotional experience. It means coming to the place where you have tasted and seen, as the psalmist says, that the Lord is indeed good and you are not the same because of it. These G's gather and gospel. You'll see here we have little statements for each of them. As followers of Jesus, we gather together each week for corporate worship where we sing his praises, hear his word preached, offer up our collective prayers and devotion to give him honor and glory. This is what God's people have always done. We have always gathered together regularly to give him praise. That doesn't mean you can't worship him in your car. You can. Your whole life is meant to be an act of devotion and worship. But there's something special and unique that God does in us when we gather together as this part of his body to worship. He's gathered us by his grace, so we gather together to give him honor and praise. And then gospel. As followers of Jesus, we believe the good news of Jesus Christ is the greatest message the world has ever known. And that we are called to share the gospel wherever we have the opportunity. Last night at our Saturday night service, I was walking in, saw some friends I hadn't seen before. They said, hey, how you doing? What's good in your life? What a great question. I immediately started to talk about my kids, how they're doing, you know? We want to talk about those things in our lives that we're excited about. Well, if it's true, That the gospel is the best news the world has ever heard. That we're the people who get to share it. We're the people who get to talk about it, to tell the good news. So gathering and gospeling is what we do. And grace, God's grace, is poured out on us and through us as we gather and share the good news. This begins when we come to know Jesus personally. It starts, I want to be clear about this. Experience grace and these six G's are not a life improvement project. It's, and you enter in by the grace of Jesus, and then this is the life he's called you to live. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 puts it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us to be born again. I, I don't know how, what you think of when you hear the phrase born again. I asked our staff that this week at our staff chapel. And some said uh, Jimmy Carter. Others said like 80s Christians. Some said like over emotional. Like it, it carries some connotations. But it's a biblical phrase. The point is this. God has not called you to clean up your act. Christ doesn't call you to get, your, get yourself together. He causes you to be born again, a whole new life. Go read John 3 in the story of Nicodemus, right? He comes to talk about the kingdom of God and Jesus says, we can't even have this conversation unless you're born again. You need a whole new life. And that's not something you create or generate or build. That's something that comes to you by grace. So an experience of grace means you're changed because you've seen how good God is in Christ. And you cannot be the same. How many of you watch the TV show, the, or not TV, I guess it's the streaming series, The Chosen? Anybody? Fantastic. I, I watched season one, loved it. Season two, I'm, I got to do some catching up to do. But one of my favorite parts of season one is the story of Mary Magdalene and her transformation after meeting Jesus. And there's a scene where she meets with Nicodemus and is trying to explain to him. He's asking questions about this Jesus. Now, that's not in the Bible. I know some of you are like, that's why I won't watch it. Just get over yourself. It's okay. He takes, <laughs> he takes a few liberties here. But, the, but she's trying to explain what Christ has done for her. And her explanation is beautiful. Here it is. You'll see a picture of it. I was, she says to him, the only way I can explain it is this. I was one way, and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between, 
was him. I was this way, and now I'm totally different, and I don't know how to tell you other than he did it. And you look through the New Testament over and over again. This is the story that everyone who meets Jesus and is transformed is telling. From the blind man to the leper to the paralytic, Mary Magdalene, Lydia, the centurion, the Philippian jailer. Like just go read through all the stories of people who meet Jesus. I, I'm different because of him. He's changed me. I'm not perfect. I don't have my act all together. He's still working on me. But I'm not the same anymore. And if you belong to Jesus, that's your story too. You were one way. And now you're different, and the thing that happened in between is him. That's what it means to experience grace. It doesn't mean an emotional song or a feeling that comes and goes. It means you've experienced the grace of Jesus, which changes you. This is the central reality of everyone who follows Jesus. So when this happens to you, you naturally want to do two things. Well, many things, but at least two. One is you want to gather together with other people who've had the same experience. You want to get together with Christians to praise him, to talk about how good he is, which is what we're doing now. To learn from his word. And you want to tell other people who have not had this experience. Because they need to know how good he is. We sang the song, how good is he? Well, how good is he to you? When, if you've tasted and seen how good he is, you want to get together with others who have had the same experience to praise him and to tell those who haven't. That's gathering gospel. The New Testament has a multitude of passages to describe this reality, but since we're already in 1 Peter, let's just stay right there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So put away all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and slander like newborn infants. So he's saying, you were one way, now live the other way. Long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up in salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, experience grace. As you come to him, a living stone, that's Jesus, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You've tasted and seen how good he is, and as you come to him, you are like living stones. He's the stone on which your life is built, the cornerstone, the foundation, and now you are joined together with others and being built up into something that God is doing. You are, there's a restoration project going on in your life if you belong to Christ. If you've come to Jesus, it doesn't mean he's uh, forgiven you and now you just hang on till heaven. He's doing something in you. Some of you know what I'm talking about. He, my, at my house, we're remodeling our uh, downstairs uh, half bath. And it's, it's not going well, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm doing it myself, which is, my son's a plumber. He handled the plumbing easy, no problem. I'm making a mess of things. There's holes in the wall that weren't there before. I'm supposed to be patching them. I can't even hang the toilet paper racket. Anyway, the, the, enough about that. That's another illustration. The point is this. When Jesus comes to, into your life, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's not just doing a little remodeling. He's remaking you. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts it in uh, his Christianity classic. Imagine yourself. Doesn't he look great there reading the book? With his, anyway. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof, and so on. And you knew those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably. and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one that you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you'd be made into a decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Isn't that good? You know, we, we think we want Jesus to come alongside and, and fix a few things. Help us get our act together. Straighten us out a little bit over here. But I've got this fine, Jesus. Just, but maybe you can help me over here. That's not what he's up to. He's tearing it all down and rebuilding something that you never even imagined. That's what he's doing. And some of you know what this is like. So the answer to the question, what is Jesus doing in my life? Sometimes it's, he's tearing things down and it hurts abominably, but I know it's good. Sometimes it's, oh, I, let me tell you what he's doing. I love people I used to not even care about now. I, I, this relationship that was a mess is being reconciled because of what he's doing. This hang up, this addiction in my life, I'm getting freedom from. Let me tell you what he's doing in my life. And by the way, in the context of 1 Peter, this is not primarily even just about you. Peter is saying this is happening to us, God's palace he wants to come and live in, 
live in himself is not just your individual heart, it's our collective community, the church. He's doing something in us. We're, being, we're told this in Ephesians chapter 2, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole structure joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also, he says, are being built together into a, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So you personally and us collectively. There's a restoration project going on. This same imagery Peter uses in his letter, he goes on and he talks about this cornerstone that is rejected by those who don't believe. He gives this contrast here between those, for those who believe in Jesus, it's the foundation, it's the cornerstone. My life rests on him. And for those who do not believe, he says it's a stumbling block, a rock of offense. The point is, either you're building your life on him or you're tripping over him. One or the other. There's no middle ground. And then he comes to this passage I want to camp out on now because it's just so good. Let's read it together. Ready? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's worth memorizing. So, so he says, some believe and are built on Christ. Some stumble over him and don't believe. But you are. Notice he says, but you are. Once you were. But now you are. But now you are. I was one way, and now I'm another way. And the thing that happened in between is him. He's done it, and he is doing it. First thing to see here, uh, this, this is amazing. It's our past, present, future, and our purpose all wrapped up in just two verses. This is Peter, by the way, the knucklehead who denied Jesus. And uh, who, you know, I mean, this is Peter, the guy who was like the greatest failure and also the rock. Jesus calls him the rock. Wrote this. It's incredible. First, I want you to see a chosen people. He says, you are a chosen race. Uh, this refers back to 1 Peter 1, 3. It calls you to be born again. That, what that means is uh, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, your primary identity marker is no longer your ethnic, racial, economic, social, familial identity. Those things still exist. God's kingdom is many colored. It's diverse. That's how Revelation tells us that. We'll be all together, every nation, tribe, and tongue singing his praises. But our primary identity marker is Christ. And so those things that once divided us or caused us to think of us and them now are, are united and brought together because we're in, it's a new race of people, in other words, from every nation, tribe, and tongue. This is crucial for us to understand. Our primary identity marker is not, frankly, even today, maybe it's worth saying, Bears and Packers fans. I don't know if you know this, but John Dixon's a Packers fan. But I still, what, what, what? But I still love him. All those things, right, brought together in Jesus. Now, the word chosen can trip you up a little bit because it sounds like, like when I grew up, you know, that we picked teams on the playground. They don't do that anymore because it's offensive to, to children. So I, maybe, I don't know. But uh, was, and so you felt like if you got picked, you're better than somebody else. Ah, they chose me. Like, in other words, to be chosen was to be chosen over someone else uh, as if somehow you're superior, better. It's sort of embedded in the phrase. That is not at all what the Bible means when it talks about being chosen by God. It's not what it's talking about at all. In fact, Peter is echoing Old Testament language here, which may be lost to us, but his readers would have understood. Here's Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was because you were more talented, more beautiful, more potential, more wealthy. It's not what he says. It was not because you're more number, in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He's saying to the Israelites, and he's saying to his church, I chose you. Why? Because I love you. And I love you. Why? Because I love you. The, the why is all wrapped up in the covenant love of God. 
you, if you belong to Jesus, it's because he chose you. If you decided to trust him, it's because he decided on you first. He chose you and you responded in faith. And there's nothing about you that deserves it. My whole life I played sports and so it's sort of ingrained in my whole life. I say that, I'm not really old now, like a small part of my life. But it, it, it like, it like uh, informed how I think in some good ways and some ways that I need undoing when it comes to the gospel. I was sort of conditioned to, to be better than somebody else, to defeat the opponent, to earn it. But when it comes to being chosen by God, that, doesn't, has, no, that has no place. Why did God choose you? Because he loves you. Why does he love you? Because he loves you. That's who he is. Because if any of it belongs to me, if any of it depends on me, then I as little pride can creep in, like I deserve this, and I could lose it in security if I'm not good enough. How many of you live with a little bit of that in your soul? Maybe God's love for me is diminishing because I'm screwing up. Mm -mm. He loves you because he loves you, and nothing can change that if you're in Christ. Because if it all depends on him, then you have security. And then he says, now let's get busy with this restoration project, this 6G life. Now because I love you and my love is, secures you, live this way. So there are chosen people. Our worth and value is not in ourselves. It's in the God who loves us. Second, a gathered people. We are a gathered people. We gather together physically, corporately, regularly because he has already gathered us. Once, remember that phrase? Once you were not a people. Let's look back at 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 10. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. I love that, that phrase. Underline this because we haven't done that. And that's fun to do. A people for his own possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Experience grace. Who are we? We're the people who have received mercy. That's who we are. We're the people, that's all that we are. We're just the people who know how great Jesus is and received his mercy and experienced his grace. That's what brings us together. That's why we're here. We gather together for that very reason. But now you are. I love the phrase, a people for his own possession. Uh, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas in here, you'll understand this analogy. My, my children, two of them are out of the house. One still lives at home, kind of. Um, and um, getting the five of us together is a joy. And it's getting harder and harder to do that. And when my kids were little, sometimes I, if I was honest, I was like, ah, I wish they would scatter a bit. Like, <laughs> it's exhausting, you know? But now I realize how precious those moments were. And I would give anything to go back to those days. I want us to be together. And my mom and dad, this, this summer, we got all the, the, the my side of the family together at a, at a lake house in, in Tennessee to celebrate the 4th of July. My parents celebrated their 58th anniversary a couple weeks ago and we're all together. And you could see in my dad and mom's faces just having the whole, even though we're a little bit nuts, just having the whole family together was such a joy. It was precious to them. They longed for it. You could just see it. And when, we, when it came time to leave, driving home, flying home, and just, you could see that, oh. Well, don't you think if we are the children of God that God delights when his children gather? Don't you think it pleases the Father when we gather together as his, as his sons and daughters? Don't you think it's precious to him? I, I, I think we take this for granted. We think of church as something, if I have time, I just got a busy weekend, I, was, I had a late night, I got things going on. And I understand, there are people watching online, many of them, hundreds of them, and there are legitimate reasons why you can't be here sometimes and, and we wanna stay connected that way and reach people that way. But gathering together is a joy and it's precious and don't take it for granted. It wasn't that long ago that we were told we cannot. We're forbidden. And I stood on this stage and there's nobody in the room preaching to that dumb red light on the camera back there. I hated that. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to take it for granted. And I'm not, this is not a guilt trip as a pastor. I'm one of you. I'm part of a church like you. What a gift it is to gather together. What a joy it is. Let's not take that for granted. It's what God's people have always done. Why? We're the, made in the image of God. He's a relational God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so we need community. It reminds us that we're not alone. It encourages others who come here. You may not realize this. Sometimes it's all you can do just to get yourself and your family here. But your very presence is an encouragement to others. It's a, it's a witness to the world. 
When God's people gather to worship, it's a witness to the rest of the world. What's going on over there? Why are all those cars there? What are they about? What's happening? It's what the church has always done. It pleases our Father. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 3, verse 16, describing the gathered people. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's not something you can do on your own. You can't do that in isolation. It's something we do together as the gathered people of God. Okay, last, a proclaiming people. A proclaiming. In this little passage from 1 Peter 2, we see that we're chosen, we're called, we're gathered by his grace, and we also see the reason why, the purpose statement. Let's look at verse 9 again of chapter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Let's read this next sentence together. Ready? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There it is. That you may proclaim. Why has he called you to, us together? Why are we gathered together? Why has he called us his chosen people for his own possession? That we may proclaim it. That we may declare it. That we, are, we exist as God's people to be proclaimers. Wasn't there a Scottish band called the Proclaimers that sang 500 miles? Is that just, I'm dating myself. Anyway, never mind. We're, we're to be the proclaimers of the good news of Jesus, of, the, of how good and excellent, the song we sang, how good is he? How excellent is he? How praiseworthy is he? How great is the gospel? Remember at the end of Danny Flores' video last week, if you were here, if you didn't go back and watch it, he says, how amazing is the gospel? It's proclaiming the good news of Jesus. We exist to do this. And I think this is crucial for us. Christians, sadly, in our culture are often known not for this, but for pointing out the problems for protesting, for uh, talking about all the issues in the culture. We should not primarily be known for pointing out all the bad. Now, now, to be sure, there are moments when it's a follower of Jesus, you just have to stand up and say, this is not okay. I'm not okay, I'm not on board with this. But fundamentally, that's not who we are. We're the people who have experienced mercy, received grace, and who proclaim, who talk about how good Jesus is with our songs, with our lives, Jesus puts it this way in Mark 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Now, you might not be able to go to every corner of the world, but you can go into your corner of the world, where you work, where you live, in your neighborhood, and live and witness and proclaim. And we do this both in our words and in our deeds. Peter makes this clear in the very next verse, in verse 12 of chapter 2, in verse 15 of chapter 3. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. By the way, Gentiles just means everybody who's not a Jew. It's like the whole world. So when, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. He's echoing Jesus' words. Let your light so shine before men, they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. In other words, live a life that is, is live out your faith publicly so that people would, would see it and wonder about it and connect it to the grace and goodness of God. In chapter 3, verse 15, Peter says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. This word, a defense here, whoop, go back one slide, sorry. Now I'm lost. I'll let you do it. One more. One more. One more. Ha <laughs> ha. I don't know where we are. There we are. <laughs> a defense. This is the Greek word apologia. It's where we get our English word apologetics from. Uh, John Dixon, who I've mentioned a few times, he founded the Center for Public Christianity in Sydney, Australia. I told him, I think we need one here. Uh, the whole point is this, of the public Center for Public Christianity, is that we, we should be engaging the public sphere with the good news of Jesus in every way. And I, I, he, I like this phrase, public Christianity, better than apologetics. People hear apologetics and they think argument, they think defensiveness, they think propaganda. That's not what we're known for. We should be known for public Christianity, though. 
meaning a public faith. And this is exactly the context of 1 Peter. The gathered people of God live their lives in such a way that it draws attention. What are they about? Why do they live this way? What is this hope that they have? And they're ready to give an apologia, a reason for, an answer to, a reasonable response pointing to the excellencies of him who has called us out of his darkness, out of darkness into his glorious light. This is what God's people do. We gather and we proclaim the gospel, the good news. Not defensiveness, notice he says. I, I, years ago, I was a youth pastor, and there's a kid named Mezgebi, is of Ethiopian family, and he, uh, he was on the debate team and loved to argue. And he was uh, learning apologetics, learning all the arguments for God. He would engage his friends in these debates and, 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 and one, it was, it would argue with them about Jesus and about God. And he came to me all dejected. Pastor Jeff, I don't understand it. Like I'm talking to all my friends. I'm giving them all the arguments and they know that I'm right, but none of them are becoming Christians. <laughs> like, well, I'm not sure it always works that way. You get argued into heaven, right? That's not how, that's not, notice he says, with gentleness and respect. Live our lives, not perfectly, none of us have it all together but such that there would be something about the character of our lives that people would ask. Maybe they ridicule, maybe they mock, maybe they scoff, maybe they genuinely want to know. Whatever the case, be ready to talk about him. How good is he, how good he is, what he's done for you, what the gospel is. Every one of us, this is not something reserved for the evangelists, the trained professionals. This is something every follower of Jesus can and must do. Gather together regularly, we need it, and proclaim his goodness. Share the gospel. That's who he is. You know what Paul says, by the way, about this idea of proclamation? He says, we do it not just with our words. We do it with our lives. We do it in the gathering. We proclaim the gospel by taking communion even, which we're going to do in a few moments. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, that we, as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. And then before, in a moment, we're going to give you a moment to prepare your hearts for communion. But I want to remind you, if you're not a member here, if you're a visitor here, it does not matter to us or to the Lord. What matters is that you know him, have experienced his grace. You have trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins. And you're willing to examine your own heart. That he welcomes you to receive bread and cup in just a few moments. Let's bow and prepare our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus. We pause now and acknowledge that none of us have everything together. Each of us struggle. But all of us, every one of us, is dependent on your grace every day. And every one of us who belongs to you, we understand that our hope is not in our goodness, but yours, demonstrated to us on the cross. Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts now as we come to your table to receive bread and cup. You, you are the bread of life, Lord Jesus, and you are living water. We'll give you just a moment right now to speak to the Lord in silence. Let the Lord remind you of what Peter says. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous and glorious light. And he's done this by dying for you in your place. Let's take the elements out now together. The bread's on the bottom. As you peel off that bottom layer and hold the bread in your hands, I'll remind you of Jesus' words to his disciples. And he said to them at that last supper, this is my body. It is given for you. Eat this and remember him. And now the cup, Jesus poured out a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death until he returns. Let's do that together.
Amen. Just want to remind you, if you're a guest here or new, we'd love to meet you right out front for a meet and greet time. And if you're here today and you'd like someone to pray with you, pray for you for any reason, we have members of our prayer team right back in the prayer room, the class room following the service. They'd love to connect with you and encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the name of the one who is holy and holy forever. Let our whole lives be lived out in devotion to him and in word and in deed to declare his glory and his excellencies now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.